hello guys and welcome back to this new episode and to our channel today we are going to talk about superpowers not in a corny way but in a real actual way there are in fact some populations that have specific superpowers have you ever wondered if superpowers actually exist well the answer is yes as I was saying in the introduction, superpowers do exist and some populations, some people, have certain superpowers. I'm not talking about psychic um, sort of superpowers because they are not scientifically proved, which doesn't mean necessarily that they don't exist, um, but that uh, we cannot generalize that to a population, we cannot explain it from a uh, scientific standpoint, so we are going to ignore it, at least for this video. What we are to focus on instead is certain real superpowers. What do I mean? Well, let's start immediately. For instance, um, Australian Aborigines um, have a super sight. What do I mean by that? Well, they are endowed, naturally, with a lot of very positive, very good skills. For instance, their body is able to regulate the temperature in a much better way than what we are able to do. For instance, it has been proven that um, um, Australian Aborigines are able to adapt to a night in which you have like zero uh, degrees much much better than an average Australian and so what that means is that they do possess skills that uh, um, uh, are uh, natural in that uh, they are just you know the result of evolution probably but that's not what we're going to talk about the a uh, very powerful skill that they do have, about which we don't know, I think, enough, is their super sight. What do I mean? They're able to see four times better than an average other person. Four to five times better. And that's incredible. And we don't have an explanation. I mean, probably the explanation is, as I was saying, in um, evolution because of their lifestyles, they might be able to see better. But like four to five times better, it's quite a lot. And it is exactly for that reason that some of them um, were and are still being um, employed by the army in the unit called Norforce. So basically the army um, enrolls them to check which illegal boat um, is in the Australian waters because their sight is so precise and so they can see very well um, very far from where they are which I thought was incredible and especially because we don't have an explanation like how that has developed and how that has not impacted us and it's probably in the fact that those are tribes that remain quite isolated do not um, uh, mix uh, so much with other people and that's probably why um, you know the rest of Australians do not enjoy this skill. I have to say that there's also an alarming uh, problem that comes with that and I'm not sure how much it is correlated with this super sight. It might be also correlated to other factors such as uh, scar side gene or diabetes and it is the fact that they have a likelihood six times higher to lose their sight once they get to the age of 40 which is like a kind of a paradox you enjoy for 40 years this beautiful eyesight that allows you to watch and look at everything with so much um you know precision and uh, clearness and then you lose it but anyway that is one good superpower let's move on Second population we are going to talk about is Sherpa. Some of you guys may have heard of Sherpa, some of you may have not. So let's talk about them. Um, they are Nepalese indigenous tribes. They have lived on the Himalayas for the last 6,000 years. So what you want, like something has to come out of that. And the skill that they have is incredibly uh, powerful and that is to produce more 
hemoglobin. And what that means is that simply there are, um, so to speak simply, but they are way more able than we are to manage their reservoir of oxygen, which this seems to me uh, environmentally derived, meaning, of course, being that they reside all the time on the Himalayas and they are, uh, they are the guides and uh, um, uh, helpers for all, the, for all the alpinists that do climb Himalayas, then naturally they must have survived. And in order to do that, they have developed that kind of skill that allows you to produce more hemoglobin, uh, manage better your oxygen. And what that means is that your body outside of that condition can enjoy way more oxygen. Now, I don't know if, you know, you pick a Sherpa and you pick someone of the Sherpa and you throw it in the city, how that will react if smog and pollution will compromise his natural abilities or not. That would be like a quite interesting experiment. And then you have to deal with probably the stress that derives um, from living in a city, um, you know, for somebody who's not used to it. But, you know, I would like to try it. Um, at least for a couple of days and see if that ability is in different contexts gets lost, you know, or remains there. But interesting. So that was number two, Sherpa. Let's go to number three, Bajau Laut. So they are a population from Malaysia, um, indigenous population. The legend goes that um, they were a kingdom, like a small kingdom, and at a certain point in time, the daughter of the king gets lost. So the king um, calls all of them up and says, guys, let's find my daughter. But the daughter was never found. And so the Bajau Lahut decided that their best option was to remain uh, into the sea and not to ever come back to land. And the reason why that legend exists is not necessarily because that is a true story, I don't know, it could be, it's a legend, but the reason why that exists is because they have an incredible skill. And that is to be able to remain in apnea for 13 minutes. Now, that is fascinating, incredible, extremely powerful, and also mind-blowing. Why? They have a larger spleen, a spleen that is basically a half bigger than mine, than yours, etc. Assuming that mine and yours have same dimensions, and what that means is like regular normal dimensions, to my knowledge anyway. Um, but they have a larger spleen and what that does is that uh, basically allows them to remain in waters in apnea that's more um, precise in apnea for up to 13 minutes of course that allows them to um, you know uh, survive that way their main activity is fishing and there should be no surprise there but like 13 minutes is like a lot of time it's not just a, a joke and the thing is, like, they have a larger spleen, right? So again, we're talking about skills they have developed um, over the course of time, you have to imagine, of the course of probably many centuries, um, evolutionarily, because there's no other explanation why, you know, certain people would have a certain spleen with certain dimensions and why the rest of the population will not have that. Of course, that is something that cannot be inherited uh, from other people because probably it's like a, uh, you know, sort of secluded tribe, meaning they don't mix with foreigners and they're not super integrated with the rest of society. So that doesn't uh, impact the rest of the world or the rest of the population of Malaysia. But amazing, you know. And then again, now you do see that there is a um, organ 
that has been modified because of that, right? So for the Sherpa, you cannot argue that because you don't really see um, anything different besides more production of hemoglobin. So you kind of wonder like, will that get lost? You know, and you know, if you throw a Sherpa uh, in the city, if you throw him, you know, somewhere in a different environment, will, will he or she lose um, their ability? But here you have a 50% larger split which I thought was fascinating, that's all. All right, let's move on. Let's go to a different population. This time around, we are in Kenya. Okay, so you guys know that um, whoever wins the marathon is probably someone from Kenya. Now, there's a reason, and the reason is not Kenya. The reason is a particular tribe that um, has the name of Kalenin. Now, uh, Kalenin um, have uh, found, and these people that have researched all of this, is University of Copenhagen, so Denmark. Apparently, they got interested in uh, superpowers of different populations. And they have done a lot of research on, you know, super abilities, superpowers um, that people might have. But anyway, um, so this tribe, Kalenin. We don't see many radical or drastic changes compared to an average person of a different population. Uh, we see only basically two factors here. One is that they have very long um, limbs, especially, this must not be generalized, they have long legs. Long and thin legs. Um, that's number one. You could also argue though that if they run and uh, you know, if they run constantly, then you kind of acquire that physical structure, right? So the fact that they have it, um, you know, uh, that they have inherit a certain structure might help them, but then you also have to train and exercise in order to get uh, into a certain shape that is functionally useful for the sport uh, that you want to practice, in this case, marathon. Um, so there's that. But they also have very small calves and very small ankles. And what that does is distributing energy better. Apparently, if you have a large calf, you're not distributing a large calves, you're not distributing your energy properly or as well as somebody who has those qualities. So those are the two factors that they have found out, which to me, it looked like, oh, that's not a big deal, right? But very little, very minute and minuscule changes like that can produce um, a huge difference in results. Finally, this tribe might be just better at running and at running long distances because of two other factors. One, it's diet that is rich in amid. Um, and number two might be the altitude they live in, which is mm, perfect for, you know, adjusting the body and regulating the amount of oxygen. Um, so then you can go and run, you know, and have a better control of the oxygen and so a better control of your respiration and better control on your movements. And so, winning. Now, let's move on. Different population. We are in Bolivia this time around and we are with the Tsimane people. Now, Tsimane people have the lowest rate of cardiac diseases. So here it has everything to do most likely with the diet. Um, there are two researchers here that we do need to mention. One super famous, Walter Longo Italian. He moved probably a long time ago um, in uh, um, California, in the US. He's a researcher there for the University of Southern California. And he has published a book that has become hugely popular on longevity. So if you have heard his name, it's probably because of that book. Um, and in that book, he describes like a diet that is probably that of rats. Like you have, you're supposed to eat as little as possible. And that's, you know, a good point to make because a lot of times we just need because we like eating, not necessarily because we treat food as our nourishment for our body. And there's nothing wrong with eating, um, you know, food that we like. Um, I would, um, think that I would not eat um, if I didn't like the food um, 
that I'm eating, probably. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but food is nourishment, right? And so, um, uh, exceeding with certain types of food can create a whole host of problems. We're not gonna discuss that, however, we're just gonna stick to the tsimani. They have a very specific diet, which is 72% of carbs, 14% of fats, 14% of proteins. Apparently that is the magical combination how to have clear arteries. And what that does is basically you live longer, you don't get, of course, studies if you don't smoke or do other activities that can compromise that. Um, and of course, sometimes your genes are predominant of whatever kind of diet you have. But in general, this should work. This type of combination, 72, 14 and 14 percent allows you to have clear arteries so no heart attacks no strokes clear arteries not cardiac diseases and that's pretty good and then last point so the last population we are going to talk about today is actually a population in Ecuador now we're talking specifically about them because we cannot extend the research um, and the results of that research to other population. But um, there is a syndrome called Laron syndrome and that causes basically a uh, insensitivity to growth hormone, which means in other words that uh, people remain uh, of a very short stature. Now, specifically Laron syndrome has been diagnosed in a group that descends from Sephardi Jews. And this group, of course, has spread. Uh, so there are some concentrations um, of these people like everywhere around the world. But um, Laron syndrome takes the name of Zavi Laron, who was a doctor in Israel that diagnosed the syndrome that caused short stature and so short height. And of the people, suffering from Laron syndrome, there's a specific group that resides in Ecuador. And according to Ahime Guevara Aguirre, what they have, which we don't have, is a superpower. That is, they do not um, suffer from cancer or diabetes. In other words, there is something connected, entrenched, deeply and rooted in the fact of having Laron syndrome that forbids you, prevents you from having diabetes or cancer. And so that is an interesting path um, to discover and to investigate. Um, because of course, if we know that, we might be able to find a cure um, that can be extended to people suffering from diabetes and cancer and that would be um, beautiful. But they do not suffer from cancer or diabetes. So there's something there to be investigated and hopefully to be found out, you know, whether it's productive to um, other people. Now, guys, this was our last superpower. So with that being said, we're done for the day. Um, of course, comment below. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know what you think. And we'll talk some more next time. In the meantime, if you have enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel. And if you want, you can also hit the notification bell so you can receive every new update. We're gonna talk next time. Bye!